Our universe hosts some of the most incredible sights. Ginormous galaxies, breathtaking nebulae, powerful supernovae, and galaxy clusters of unfathomable sizes, spanning across thousands of light years. And yet, all these sites are only a fraction of what we know must be out there. According to our very best estimates, all ordinary matter that we can see only accounts for 15% of all mass. The remaining 85% of mass is something called dark matter. But if we can't see it, how can we be so sure it's there? In today's episode, we will go on a journey through science and time to get to our modern day understanding of the mysterious thing that we call dark matter. Let's travel back in time to the year 1933. It was a time when Swiss astronomer Fritz Zwicky was studying the Coma Cluster, a cluster of over 1,000 identified galaxies. Zwicky was the first to estimate the total mass of the cluster by using the theory of theorem. From this, you can determine the mass by observing how fast the galaxies around it move. So Zwicky went ahead and did the calculation. And what he found is that there must be 400 times more mass than we could actually see. And he also came up with a term for this missing mass. And he called it Dunkel Materie, or Dark Matter. Scientists at the time, however, did not take his proposal seriously. But that would all change some 40 years later, when Vera Rubin and Kent Ford published the rotation curves of the Andromeda Galaxy. What they found is that the rotational speed stays approximately constant when going further away from the center of the galaxy, while, based on the luminosity distributions, you'd expect them to be high near the center and then decay as you move further away. The stars in the outer rings were going much faster than could be explained by the visible mass present. They should have long been ejected from their orbit. Actually, let's break down the physics. We see that the stars are in a stable orbit. So that means there must be a balance of forces. So which forces could that be? Well, the gravitational force of course has to be there. And then there's also the centripetal force due to the circular motion of the stars. So let's write these forces down. Gravity is quite simple. The force equals the gravitational constant multiplied by the mass of the star and the mass of the galaxy and then divided by the distance between the star and the galaxy's center of mass squared. For the centripetal force, it's simply the mass of the star multiplied by its velocity squared and then divided by the distance between the galaxy's center of mass and the stars. Now what we can do is set these two equal to each other. Immediately, we can see that the mass of the star falls out. Now we are left with a simple equation that tells us how much mass must be in a galaxy if we know the velocity of the star and the radius from the center. And as it turns out, these are simple parameters that we can actually measure. And when we do this, we find that there is a lot more mass than we can see, making the hypothesis of dark matter hard to escape. In the decades since, more evidence has kept popping up from different independent sources, all pointing towards one common theme, dark matter. But if your data is not matching your predictions, this could mean two things. One, your data is not correct. For example, you are missing mass. Or two, your theory for making the predictions is not correct. So perhaps we should be modifying gravity. Well, this is exactly what Mordechai Milgram did in the 1980s, when he introduced modified Newtonian dynamics, or MONT. It's a relatively simple idea that modifies gravity in the low acceleration limit. As a result, with some tweaking, you could get it to explain the rotational curves we discussed before. One big issue with MONT, however, is that it really does not fit in well with our modern day understanding of physics. For example, it does not conserve momentum, or angular momentum, or even energy, all of which are incredibly important quantities that are usually conserved. The real nail in the coffin for Mont came in 2006, when a group of astronomers were studying a pair of merging clusters, known as the Bullet Cluster. They mapped the intensity distribution of X-rays coming from ordinary matter 
And by studying microlensing effects, they were also able to determine the mass distribution. And when they overlapped the two, they found the following. The center of ordinary mass here is highlighted in pink, and the center of all mass, primarily dark, is highlighted in blue. The fact that the two centers are separated shows the most direct evidence we have for dark matter. During the collision of the clusters, it is believed that the dark matter of the clusters passed through without interacting much, while the ordinary matter actually interacted and slowed down, thus separating the centers of the two. By now, the general scientific consensus is that dark matter does exist. By studying microlensing effects in the sky, we have been able to map dark matter. Here, the lighter areas indicate high densities, and the dark areas indicate low densities of dark matter. And what we find is essentially a web of dark matter. The cosmic web. Due to dark matter's hypothesized limited interactions, it is actually quite hard for dark matter to form condensed structures, like dark matter stars or dark matter planets. Normal matter has many ways to lose energy and momentum, allowing it to spiral towards a shared center of mass, clumping together to form a star or a planet. Dark matter, however, does not have this option of losing momentum, thus forming much larger structures, a web of filaments of higher densities spreading throughout the universe. This is where computer simulations are incredibly helpful. They show us how dark matter comes together to form structures and how ordinary matter then interacts with it. Dark matter will usually come together in a sort of three-dimensional web, and gas clouds and galaxies will then align themselves along the threads of this web. Many galaxies are even surrounded by what we call dark matter halos. Spheres of dark matter reaching out much further into space than the visible mass, essentially making galaxies a lot larger than they seem. Computer simulations also seem to indicate that without this dark matter halo, galaxies would not actually be stable. Meaning that without dark matter, we may not even be able to exist. In this simulation, you can see a network of dark matter, with the bright white spots being galaxies and their halos. On the right, you see the dark matter overlaid with ordinary matter. You can really see how dark matter orchestrates the large-scale cosmic order, laying down the threads along which all our familiar structures form. So with all this evidence for dark matter, experiments worth billions and spanning decades have been run trying to directly detect it from the Large Hadron Collider to small-scale semiconductor experiments. All, however, have not turned up with anything yet. So why is it so hard to actually detect dark matter? Well, the reason is twofold. First of all, dark matter does not interact with the electromagnetic force, making it very hard for us to detect. And second of all, we have no clue what we're actually looking for. Dark matter could weigh much less than an electron or it could weigh as much as a black hole. We simply do not know. As Surjit Rajendran likes to put it, trying to catch dark matter is like catching a fish in the ocean. The problem with the fish is that, although you know it's in the ocean, you don't know much else about it. It could be as small as a Nemo fish, or it could be as large as a blue whale. Well, if that blue whale is about the size of the observable universe. That's how hard this is. We have very little idea of which nets to use to actually catch the fish. But how can we actually be able to probe this vast space of possibilities? Well, there are a few options. The first option is to go for a direct detection experiment right here on Earth. Usually this involves highly sensitive experiments buried deep within the Earth to shield it from cosmic radiation and human-generated noise. For example, the Xenon experiment. It is set up hidden deep under the mountains in Italy. These experiments are looking for a particular kind of dark matter, the WIMPs, weakly interacting massive particles. A WIMP is a proposed new elementary particle that interacts weakly with ordinary matter besides through gravity and has a relatively high mass. In a supersymmetric extension of the standard model, a particle with very similar characteristics to the WIMP 
is actually predicted, making it a likely dark matter candidate. The hope is that WIMPs may very rarely actually collide with the nucleus of ordinary atoms, and as a result, make the nucleus emit a bit of light due to the transfer of energy. So these experiments are essentially giant collision detectors, consisting of a fat of liquid noble gas, in this case xenon, with light detectors all around it. Noble gases are chosen because they hardly react with anything else, lowering the chance of false detections. By very precisely measuring the energy of the light detected, one can determine what may have caused the collision, allowing you to rule out terrestrial sources and ideally find the dark matter signature you are looking for. Over the whole world, there are several experiments just like this, all trying to find dark matter. One downside, they are extremely expensive. Another downside, none of them have found conclusive evidence. Another approach for direct detection experiments is by using particle accelerators. One way to look for dark matter is by actually creating it yourself. By smashing together protons at incredible velocities, you can generate new particles in the collision. Dark matter can be detected by analyzing all the particles that were generated in a collision and determining if there's any missing mass. This missing mass is a good sign for dark matter being generated. This, however, has also not found the elusive dark matter we have been looking for. To further probe new mass ranges, we need larger particle colliders at higher energies. Again, this costs a lot of money. So what if there's a much cheaper way of looking for dark matter that at the same time also probes a larger mass range? Well, it turns out there may be. By actually using space itself as the biggest lab, cosmic rays, for example, act as ultra-high energy astrophysical colliders, which could act as a probe of dark matter in the sky. Then there's also the option that dark matter actually has self-interactions. Currently, we think that the only force dark matter interacts through is gravity. But what if dark matter has its own forces? If dark matter does have self-interactions, we could start looking for its signs. For example, we could study the dark matter halos surrounding galaxy clusters. If dark matter does have self-interactions, we would expect these to be more spherically symmetric. Or we could study the behavior of merging systems. Or perhaps dark matter is able to self-annihilate. If that were the case, we would expect to find excess amounts of radiation that we cannot explain in any other way. So what would that look like? Well. Probably, you would expect to find more amounts of excess radiation in areas where the mass density is higher, because here there's more dark matter that is actually able to annihilate with itself. For example, in the center of a galaxy. When studying the Milky Way, astrophysicists discovered something quite extraordinary. They discovered an unexpected surplus of gamma ray radiation, known as the galactic center giga electron fold axis. Some astronomers argue that this may be due to the self-annihilation of dark matter. Others, however, are not so sure and speculate that it may be due to millisecond pulsars. If that were the case, the signal should consist of a multitude of single sources. Very recent work, however, has shown that not to be the case. It showed that the axis is rather smooth and additionally spherically symmetric, which is in line with self-annihilating dark matter. What's more, we can actually detect how heavy this dark matter should be and find a mass of around 9 times 10 to the power minus 26 kilograms, or just about the mass of a proton, giving us yet another particle to look for in our direct dark matter detection experiments. Most importantly, we can look at other regions of space where we should see a similar axis to confirm or disprove our hypothesis of self-annihilating dark matter. One candidate we didn't talk about is Axion dark matter. Axions are theorized to be bosons with a very light mass, meaning that if they account for dark matter, they must be passing right through us at incredible rates non-stop. Since we know how much mass of dark matter there must be in total, if the mass of the particle goes down, the number of particles must increase proportionately. 
This could allow us to detect Axion Dark Matter with solid state devices, which are about the size that could actually fit in the table, making it a lot cheaper and also a lot easier to fabricate than these large WIMP detectors. Experiments for Axion detection have also been run, but have also not returned anything as of yet. There are still many other dark matter candidates that we didn't cover, such as primordial black holes, sterile neutrinos, standard model neutrinos, wimp silas, machos, fuzzy dark matter, and more. Although these do all seem pretty unlikely for various reasons. All in all, dark matter plays an incredibly important role in how we understand our modern universe. We are pretty sure it must be everywhere, and yet we have the faintest clue of what it actually is. And that, I think, is a pretty beautiful, dark mystery that keeps us wondering and curious. <laughs>